Good morning, everyone. My name is James Diamond from Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Environment Department of the Federal Government in Canada. I met uh, several of you before, but I see some new names showing up at the webinar today. Thanks very much for, for joining us um, in various times of your days. Uh, I think we've got a, an interesting hour planned for the group. Um, I would like to um, characterize the meeting itself. Um, I'm here as one of the co-chairs of the GMI Oil and Gas Subcommittee, along with Paulina Serrano from Mexico. Uh, you'll hear her voice in a couple of minutes as I um, conclude the uh, initial opening remarks. Um, my job at the beginning is really just to uh, remind you of uh, kind of some tips we've got for, for running the webinar itself. So I hope you can all hear me okay, and I'd remind you that I can't hear you. We are in listen-only mode during the presentations. There are two significant presentations that will take up most of the time, and then we'll conclude with some um, some business in terms of the, the subcommittee. Uh, there will be time, though, when the lines will be opened up for a question and answer period after each presentation. So please uh, take some notes if you've got some questions or more issues uh, to raise, and, and we'll We'll bring that up at the end of each presentation. Um, I'd also uh, recognize that if you join using the telephone, uh, please make sure that you've entered the audio pin that is shown after joining the webinar. That uh, that process is what will allow us to unmute your line for a question and answer uh, during those periods. If you do have any technical difficulties, we're being helped uh, in this process by Tetra Tech. Uh, so thanks very much. I'll turn it over to Paulina to talk some more about the uh, specific uh, presentations and introduce our speakers. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Paulina from Mexico. Uh, I'm working in Pemex in the Sustainability Division. Uh, please let me introduce Kate Hyde from the U.S. Climate Change Division and uh, Michelle Knott from Tetra Tech as a contractor providing administrative support. Uh, could you both speak briefly to introduce yourselves and present a brief, brief background of the work you do? Thanks, Paulina. Um, this is Kate Height. I'm with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm the new um, U.S. Delegate to the Oil and Gas Subcommittee. Um, I'm new to this work, um, but I've been with EPA for about a decade, um, working in a number of different areas, including our greenhouse gas inventory, our greenhouse gas reporting program on our international negotiations under the UNFCC, um, and then in addition to doing some of our work on carbon market development. So I really welcome this opportunity to work with you all, and I'm looking forward to engaging substantively with the subcommittee today and in the months that follow. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, hello, this is Michelle Nolte with Tetra Tech. As Paulina mentioned, I will be providing administrative contractor support to the subcommittee. I have several years of experience supporting EPA's domestic programs in the U.S., including the Natural Gas Star and Methane Challenge programs, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. So let us review today's agenda. Uh, we have the welcoming remarks that we have already already done them, an introduction to the Global Methane Challenge by GMI Secretariat. Uh, then we have a technical briefing for identification and evaluation of uh, greenhouse gas reductions and energy efficiency improvement opportunities at the oil and gas facilities, with the idea to review and contrib contribute it to its update. Then we have a brief discussion about implementing the subcommittee uh, 2018 action plan, and then the upcoming events on 2019, and a wrap up. So we, as, as we said, we will have a brief presentation of the Global Methane Challenge by the GM Secretariat and how it aligns with our action plan. So our next speaker is Monica Shamimura, from GMI Administrative Support Group. Monica. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I am very delighted to be here with, with you, and thank you for joining our GMI Oil & Gas Subcommittee webinar today. Um, as Paulina mentioned, my name is Monica Shimamura. I am the director of the Administrative Support Group, or better known as the Secretariat. 
Today I wanted to share with you our exciting program that we have for 2019. It's called the Global Methane Challenge. It's an opportunity to showcase our methane mitigation actions that we are doing or working towards. Um, so just to provide a little bit of background on the Global Methane Challenge, where it came about, it was an idea that came about at the Global Methane Forum in 2018, where the idea was constructed and out of the GMI Steering Committee, which is essentially like our board of directors for the Global Methane Initiative. A task force was developed this year, this summer, and we developed the contents of the Global Methane Challenge, and it was adopted by the GMI Steering Committee in July of 2018. So why are we doing this challenge? It's to raise awareness about methane emissions, to encourage methane reductions around the world. As we all know, methane is a short-lived climate pollutant, so the reductions that we do now it has short it has significant short term benefits it's also cost we know cost effective technologies and proven technologies that we can use to capture and use methane as an energy source therefore this elevates the conversation of methane mitigation to give you an overview of the challenge what is this challenge about uh, it's open to all public and private sector actors that are interested in highlighting, showcasing what they are doing, what you are doing to reduce methane emissions. The goal of the challenge is to make more ambitious actions to reduce methane emissions and to showcase these policies, technologies that are being used to reduce methane emissions around the world. And it is for the year of the calendar year of 2019. Why should you participate in the challenge? Why should we all participate in the challenge? It's because each participant will be publicly recognized for your actions that are working towards reducing methane emissions. It's an opportunity to highlight new actions that you are doing, or just as importantly, things that you are doing right now. It's If you're doing methane emission reduction projects or working towards certain technologies that are ongoing right now, we want to encourage you to highlight those actions. And we will be highlighting this on our Global Methane Challenge website, which will showcase your actions. And also, we are working with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, CCAC, and the United Nations for Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE. So at these events, we will be highlighting what the Global Methane Challenge, what those actions are um, at each of these events. Also, collectively, I, I believe, we all believe that if we can showcase what we're doing, we can raise the awareness and catalyze broader action. And lastly, we will be collecting all the information, all the actions that we've been working on 2019 to, to showcase this at an event in 2020, a capstone event, that we will be highlighting what we've accomplished in the year of 2019. So I've been talking about the challenge, but what are the actions? So there's multiple actions that you can take. Some of them are listed here, such as monitoring methane emissions, uh, creating an inventory, developing an action plan, providing technical or financial support to projects, uh, putting on a workshop, doing uh, capacity building, or showcasing a methane mitigation project. These are just some of the cross-cutting, high-level actions that you, your company, your country can do to uh, participate in the challenge. Also, GMI has five different sectors that we work in, we, which are listed here, agriculture, coal mines, municipal solid waste, wastewater, and obviously oil and gas. We can highlight specific actions in your sector that you are doing, something that some kind of technology, some kind of uh, mitigation action that you are doing, we can list those as well, um, highlight those stories, highlight the actions that you are doing. Um, on the Global Methane Challenge. 
So how how do you do this? How do you participate in the challenge? Uh, it's it's very easy. Uh, we've made it simple, so it's not a burden. It's it's a simple form that you fill out just like this, um, which I'll have a bigger screenshot in the next couple slides, but it's only a couple of pieces of information and the Secretariat will um, likely contact you if we have any further questions or we would like to expand on some of the information that you've provided. So we really encourage you to visit the Global Methane Challenge website. It is uh, the URL is listed here. Um, it's very easy to remember. It's just globalmethane.org backslash challenge. Please visit and look at our websites and participate. And this is another screenshot of the website where we will highlight your actions. We plan to put different activities and actions on our map to highlight what's happening around the world. And I think it will be very interesting to see where the activities are and what type of activities are taking place globally to reduce methane emissions. And again, here is, as I mentioned before, tell us your story, tell, what you, tell us what you're doing to highlight or to reduce methane emissions. Uh, it's very simple. It's very easy to do. If you have any questions about what to enter, um, we're here to respond and help um, assist with this. But um, if you enter it, uh, we will reach out to you and contact you to, if there's any missing information or if we want to expand on some of that information, we will contact you. And here is our information for... Um, email and phone number and we really encourage you to contact us if you have any questions or comments or just want some information on methane mitigation we're happy to provide that we also do have social media facebook twitter and linkedin um, the urls are here i wanted to thank you again for your time um, i know everyone's very busy and taking the time out to listen and to participate on this webinar. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any of them or my colleagues can help answer them. So again, thank you very much. So this is Kate again. Please submit your questions via the chat feature on GoToWebinar. Um, you can do that throughout the webinar and we'll go ahead and address those at the, at the conclusion of the webinar. Thanks for your understanding. Okay, great. So um, Kate again. Hey there. <laughs> Um, so I'm next gonna gonna hand control over to, to Dave Picard from Clearstone Engineering to talk a little bit about um, some proposed updates to a um, sort of greenhouse gas assessment um, audit manual that was developed back in 2008. Um, we're we're thinking about GMI is thinking about investing in an update of this document, but would really love to get the perspective of this group on um, some of the ideas that we're thinking about for improvements to it, um, especially in light of the technical guidance documents that are now available um, from the Climate Clean Air Coalition's Oil and Gas Methane Partnership. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dave, who'll give sort of an overview of um, what this manual is and some of the updates that we're considering making. Take it away, Dave. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. and. and speak on this particular topic. So about eight years ago, we prepared a what we called an emission audit manual, which at the time was part of work we were doing in China with CMPC. The, uh, the project was funded by both the, uh, the Canadian government through Canada's Upstream Petroleum Air Emissions Research Initiative, as well as through um, the Global Methane Initiative at the time. It's, it's not a lengthy document. It's 31 pages of text in the main body of the report. Um, but it was, it was intended to be a quick reference guide that would assist the, the technical experts that we were working with in China to help them go through an auditing process at their facilities. So it was really a, a capacity building tool that we had created to help them systematically identify and assess greenhouse gas reduction opportunities at their sites. So I won't read through this, but in the interest of making this presentation something that would be useful to people after the fact, um, I, I did take the opportunity to cut out this portion of the executive summary and, and put it in the presentation. So it, it provides a bit of a, a detailed 
description of what's in the document and, and why it was was generated. But I'll go to that actually in some of the other slides that uh, are still in this deck. So the basic rationale for conducting integrated audits um, at the time when we were working in China, there was certainly interest in, in targeting methane reduction opportunities, but there was also interest in in taking advantage of the fact that we were on site and, and we had a team of experts and we had a toolbox full of tools uh, to try and do as much as we could. And in fact, what we found was if you were to do a program where you specifically targeted one type of opportunity, um, those types of opportunities tended to be skewed and you wouldn't necessarily get the most bang for your buck if you took that approach. And, and going in with more of a holistic approach where you reacted to the opportunities that you could see when you arrived at the site made more sense. And so, um, although in the beginning you would do a desk review to try and identify what, or at least anticipate what types of opportunities you might see, many sites when you actually got there, the key opportunities may not have been exactly what you were expecting. And, and again, that was part of the reason for wanting to do these integrated audits. But another reason as well was that um, often individual facilities had specific priorities and even the overall companies that we were dealing with had their own priorities. And the likelihood of a project going forward was much more likely if we try to align with those priorities in terms of what sorts of opportunities we were actually targeting. So taking a holistic approach allowed us some freedom and flexibility to do that. So for example, if a site was having issues with um, some of the nearby residents because of black smoke from their site, well then focusing on some of the flaring related issues made a lot of sense because it, it is a source of methane due to inefficiencies, but um, the, the black smoke that's occurring is something that was causing them grief with their, their neighbors and targeting that source was something that the site was potentially keen on doing. So not all sites were like that, but that was just an example of some of the sorts of things that would, would help carry a, a project forward. So why update the manual? Well, it was created in 2008, so it's, it's 10 years old. Uh, there's a lot of information that, um, at least a lot of knowledge that is been gained over the last 10 years that um, would allow us to enhance and improve some of the sections, but as well uh, contribute new sections to, to the document. Um, some of the, the areas where there's been a lot of growth has been what are the key sources to target. So uh, right now, one of the things that we're wanting to do is align the document with uh, the CCC OMG MP priority sources, and there's nine of those and align with the classification scheme that's being used by the, the CCAC for that. Um, there's improved knowledge of what to, to look for. So simple signs that can be used when you get on site to get a sense as to where some of the larger opportunities might be. Uh, there's been certainly improvements in measurement techniques that have evolved over the last 10 years and even control strategies that um, are worth updating in the document. There's also um, a much more improved understanding of the enabling conditions for successfully advancing greenhouse gas reduction projects. In the beginning, I think there was a sense that if you found a methane reduction opportunity and you could put a dollar value to it, um, it would naturally progress and people would take action on it. And that wasn't always the case. And part of the reason was when we were doing these initial surveys, we would simply do a, a course economic evaluation of the opportunity and, and the, the reliability of those estimates wasn't sufficient for senior management and investors to really make sound business decisions on. So there was a need to actually advance from initial screening type approach where you identify opportunities and, and put some course dollar value to them to actually developing a more refined business case that looks at what are the true costs of implementing the project and what are some of their potential risks to the project. Um, what are the actual site-specific requirements to, to implement that solution? And in particular, to also highlight some of the co-benefits that um, would be associated with that particular opportunity. So it, it's not just the, the direct value of the methane reduction opportunity and the fact that you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but there, there may be secondary benefits like reducing the black smoke that would be uh, particularly powerful in helping to 
convince management and, and site personnel to, to advance a particular opportunity. Um, and as well, there's been a lot of interest in, in recent years in trying to promote or stimulate activity in greenhouse gas reductions. And so there's been a lot of thought put into funding mechanisms that could be used to help support these types of projects. So there's new information and the knowledge there that would be worth putting in this particular document. So for the rest of this presentation, anything that um, is really either new or an area where we would substantively update the document, we've highlighted in green, and anything that's existing that um, we would review and, and critique, but um, not necessarily make a lot of substantive changes to is in colors, either blue or, or black. So when you look at this slide, um, of course, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things would be to restructure the the document to align with the, um, the nine core methane emission sources that are identified by CCAC OM, or say OGMP. And there, um, what we would do is currently we have a section on fugitive equipment leaks. We would, and then in that section, we've been dealing with um, compressor seals. So now we would, would break compressor seals out as separate sections and have one for centrifugal compressors and one for reciprocating compressors. Uh, the document currently has a section on venting, but it doesn't get into the specifics of well venting of for liquids unloading or venting associated with um, well completion activities or casing head gas venting on stripper wells. So that type of information again would be broken out into separate sections and, and provide we would provide more detail on what would be the, the measurement techniques and control options that would apply to those particular types of sources. Um, currently, the document has a section on combustion equipment. So it's kind of a, a liberal interpretation of a, an emissions or a methane emission source because it's largely a CO2 emission source. But if there's any inefficiencies in that source, then of course you, you will have some methane emissions from it. And of course, there's indirect contributions from the fact that you're producing gas to, to fuel the equipment and there's the upstream emissions associated with that, that fuel use. So what we're proposing to do is retain the, the, the combustion equipment section, um, but also add in a section on, on fuel gas systems because that would, would bring in um, issues such as using blanket gas on storage tanks and, and managing that, um, managing purge gas on vent and flare systems and just normal um, energy uses of the, of the fuel gas. So there is a bit of text in the document on, on how to conduct a, an audit, and really it, it focuses on what are the most likely opportunities given the type of facilities, and, and how would you quickly determine that they're worth pursuing once you're at the site. Uh, but there is value in actually expanding on the full process that you would go to from the identification stage through to actually getting support to, to implement the, um, the project itself. So the key elements that we would, uh, would develop in the project would, or in the manual would be screening and ranking of opportunities, uh, development of refined business cases, accessing financing, uh, documentation, or documentation of direct benefits and co-benefits, and catalyzing ongoing and self-sustaining implementation activity. Uh, there's also sections at the end of the document on source specific guidance, so section on tanks, section on venting. Um, those are the, the sections that I mentioned earlier are part of the, the nine core sources that we would um, rework and align with the, the CCAC ranking, and, or sorry, not ranking, but uh, classification scheme. Um, the document currently focuses on what are the direct benefits in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the impact on, on climate forcing. It really doesn't get into a lot of detail on potential co-benefits. Co and, and again, to, to access some of the, the new funding mechanisms that are available, um, showing that there are significant co-benefits to the project can be a critical factor in, in getting support for a project and helping it to go forward. Some of the key areas, depending on who you're talking to and the circumstances that you're dealing with, would be things like improved workplace air quality, which certainly has a, 
a direct impact on worker health and safety benefits. Um, improved local air quality, which key factor there would be improving public relations, uh, reduced wastage and inefficiencies resulting in improved profitability. So being able to convert or conserve product and, and get it into the, the system and, and to market uh, versus simply venting or flaring it and making your system as efficient as possible and more reliable. Those are all positive things that um, tend to align with a lot of engineering thinking. Um, and then an improved marketplace profile, which giving you best in class recognition for having take a, taken an approach that's aligned with sustainable development and, and social responsibility. And collectively, all of this helps to give you better access to some of the green funds. And, and this is important, particularly now when a lot of um, financiers are pretending to shy away from the oil and gas sector. And the gap that they're leaving is an opportunity to now attract in new types of investors, which would be the, the, the green funds that, that exist to try and cost effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve these, these co-benefits. So one last um, point to, to make with respect to the manual, um, the initial version of the document when it looked at valuing um, methane reduction opportunities, it tended to do it based on the calorific value of the, the stream that you were looking at. And then that makes sense to a, a certain degree, um, certainly if you're using the gas on site for fuel use, then thinking of it in terms of its calorific value is a logical thing to do. Um, but if you're wanting to maximize the, the money that you can potentially get out of that stream, generally, if it's a rich natural gas stream, it makes more sense not to burn it as fuel, but to first process it and remove some of the higher value components in that stream, which would be your LPGs and uh, your, your natural gas liquid, so your pentanes plus component. Those particular fractions tend to be much more valuable these days than the, the methane fraction. And often, because of that, uh, the total value and, and the key driver for your, your economics on these projects is driven not by the, the methane contribution, but it's driven by the LPG and the NGL contribution. In fact, a lot of traditional gas companies now are tending to rebrand themselves as being um, liquids producers where they're going in and looking specifically for rich gas plays where they can draw out those, those fractions and get them to market because they're not making their money on the, the, the methane side. Typically what you would be using the methane for is to fuel a process where you would capture this gas and, and extract these more valuable fractions and get them to market. And a, another unique thing about doing that, or at least using that strategy is that if it's an oil production facility, a lot of times if you've extracted these more valuable fractions, you can reintroduce them into the oil stream and have it stay in solution and use it or take advantage of the existing uh, transportation systems for the oil side to get that extra product to market. So now you're doing something useful and you're minimizing your capital costs to, to get that to market. Let's just give you uh, an example. These are not necessarily uh, current pricing, but they're pricing that um, we, we took from a fairly recent project. So the natural gas uh, here is valued at $4.06 US a gigajoule. Ethane typically is, is valued based on a, a volumetric uh, numerator, or sorry, denominator. Um, so here it's $75.47. LPG is, is usually expressed in terms of liquid volumes and the same as uh, the, the natural gas liquids. And it's, it's hard to make sense of that data when you look at those pricing and they're all on different, on a different basis. But if you look at the table below, what I've done is I said, well, okay, if the value of natural gas is set equal to one, what is the value of these other commodity streams on an energy basis relative to the natural gas pricing? So when you do that, you see that the ethane comes out at exactly the same price as natural gas, but the LPG fraction was, in this particular case, 5.7 times more valuable than the, the methane fraction is on an energy basis and the NGLs are 4.2 times more valuable than the methane on energy basis. So clearly trying to extract those commodities out of the system and, and get the higher value for them is what you really want to do. And that means 
not burning it on site as fuel, but it means getting it to a gas processing facility where it can be processed to remove those fractions or putting in a small scale solution at the site to, to recover those fractions and then use the natural gas to, or the methane fraction to, to power that process. So that's kind of current thinking that a lot of companies are applying. And it's, uh, it's an approach or a strategy that uh, makes sense in the current economic environment that we have in the oil and gas sector. And it's something that needs to be elaborated in the, um, the audit manual. So that's the end of my presentations. Uh, thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, any questions, please? Hi, yes, um, David, this is Michelle. We've had one question come in. Um, the person is asking, is this updated audit manual uh, released? And if so, where can they access this document? So the current version of it, um, I haven't actually confirmed whether it's still available on the, the website, but initially it was uh, published through PTAC, which is a an organization in Canada. So I, I believe it may be still available there, but I'd have to check and confirm that. Uh, but no, it hasn't been updated. The, the purpose of this presentation was to really describe what it is that's being proposed and, and get feedback on people that would be interested in, in seeing such a document. And this is Kate um, from the US. We can make the older document, the 2008 version, available following the webinar on the GMI website so you can take a look at what has been done. Um, but just note that, as Dave just remarked upon, that the plan is to, to update that document. But you can certainly see what's been done in the past in that version. We'll distribute that following the webinar. We also have another question. Uh, once you combine the liquids with crude oil, how do companies take advantage of the liquids price? So it, it really depends on how the um, ownership of that product is managed and, and who gets credit for it. And that sometimes can be a challenge. So um, the worst case scenario is you, you put these higher value commodities into your crude oil and you simply get crude oil pricing for those commodities because you sell that as a a final product. So what it, the benefit is you, you've increased the volume of your, your liquid product, so you are getting it to market and getting those higher value commodities to market, but it, it may not be you that realizes it, may be the refinery that realizes that once they receive the product. But if it's an integrated company, eventually somewhere in the system, getting it into the crude oil or getting it to a gas plant where they can sell it directly to market is the right thing to do because that will maximize the benefit to the overall company. Another question, where do you see the major improvements on the CCAC technical guidance documents, or is it just an alignment to the CCAC techno technical guidance documents? So where do you see the major improvements to the CCAC technical guidance documents? So if you go back to the um, the slide where I first showed the nine categories that exist under the CCAC. Um, some of those were new, and some of them reflected a more refined disaggregation of categories that currently exist in the document. So the ones that are in green are where I see either we're providing a more refined disaggregation of that a particular source category or it's a new category that we're adding in. So there would be more substantive changes there. But the intent is still to re review the whole document and, and certainly correct any typos and those sorts of issues that may be in there and provide general improvement to the whole document. But the focus would be on the green areas that are highlighted in this presentation. And this is Kate from US EPA. I think that um, in addition, you know, I mean, I think that we don't want to reinvent the wheel with regard to the guidance documents that have already been developed under the CCAC. Um, Dave did remark upon the, the improvements that, that he sees um, might be possible. I think one benefit to this document is sort of providing some context for those technical guidance documents, right? So 
um, the OGMP, CCAC OGMP provides these documents in order to sort of guide you source by source, how you may, may be able to assess and mitigate emissions from those sources. Um, I see this document as sort of providing the context for that, right? Why would you, how would you go about doing a holistic assessment? Once you've done that assessment, potentially employing the guidance documents provided by the CCAC, then how do you decide which of those things that you have identified for improvement you might want to prioritize and how and how would you make the business case for um, for moving forward with projects to mitigate those emissions? That's kind of how I, I see it. Well, and some of that is actually reflected in the fact that it's not a long document. I mean, currently it's 31 pages, so it, it doesn't get into a lot of depth on control technologies. It doesn't get into a lot of depth on measurement techniques, it, but it points you to where you can find information on that. And that would be the intent. We're, we're not trying to make it into a comprehensive compendium of information that relates to all aspects of, of doing an audit and, and actually implementing solutions. It's to help you guide, it's to help guide you through the process and, and point you to where useful information already exists. Okay, so we have, um, it looks like we have one last comment here. Um, it says that in, in sort of uh, putting the document together, it suggests that we reflect in that document a better understanding of how the nine core sources identified in the CC, AC, OGMP are relevant to operators um, who may be members of GMI. So thank you for that, um, that comment, and we'll take that into consideration as we're considering updates to the document. And thank you, Dave, for um, presenting that really useful and interesting information. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to James and Paulina. Thanks very much. It's James Diamond talking right now. Um, I think we'll be going back and forth as we um, just run through a couple of slides right now to kind of bring this this uh, technical discussion and kind of back to the core of the subcommittee work and the action plan that was initiated last year um, and, and is intended to uh, to show progress this year. Um, so I'd go to the, to the slide um, talking about the action plan adopted in April 2018. Uh, essentially to remind people that the, what we identified as a subcommittee uh, in Calgary, the uh, in Calgary and then in, in Toronto in April, um, four goals uh, to execute, uh, to, to kind of bring the subcommittee back, back on track. Um, those four goals talked about establishing long-term relationships, developing the tools and resources to enhance capacity building efforts, identify and address barriers to projects, and identify country-specific needs and opportunities. Uh, during our discussion, we, we um, and subsequent to that meeting, uh, we realized kind of how much work is is uh, described in the, in these uh, objectives, and the decision uh, among the, the the committee members was to identify for now on two of these objectives: to identify and address barriers to projects, and to identify country specific needs and opportunities. And depending on on the individual um, country or participant in the in the action plan, I think uh, there may be a um, one or the other of these moving forward. I also wanted to kind of draw attention to the content of the material presented today by Monica and Dave that I think fit very well within these uh, within this action plan. So um, the first part that we wanted to to uh, make progress on was the identify and address barriers to projects. We talked about it during the last call and made some progress in terms of how we might do that. But we really didn't progress as much as we wanted to between these two calls. The intention was to try and collect information electronically from members, and we didn't carry that process forward. I think we'll try and do that following this call. Um, but uh, Dave's presentation today, uh, even with the old um, the old uh, guidance document, kind of suggests some of how that might happen uh, for individual companies or or countries who are working on those projects and looking at those barriers. Identifying country-specific needs and opportunities was really, a, uh, in, in part, uh, an opportunity to, to kind of build a network uh, of countries who are taking action on methane and to try to um, cross-fertilize that action, um, looking at what's happening in specific countries, uh, connect that to the barriers to projects as, as needed, and kind of build off that 
and identify the opportunities, including the country-specific action plans that are uh, attached to the GMI activity generally and, and available on the website. So uh, I think today it's primarily to remind um, several new new people who are joining the call today, uh, as well as a few of us who've, who've uh, been here for a few calls right now, uh, where we decided to focus the activity right now. And um, I, I know we're having some challenges in terms of uh, discussion uh, through this through this uh, webinar today, but uh, I'd certainly invite Paulina to to um, add anything that I've missed there, and then uh, ask if anybody's got any uh, any questions about the, the action plan itself. Oh. Not hearing anything. I hope you guys can still all hear me. Um, I'd go to the next slide then, uh, specifically uh, focus on identifying and addressing key barriers to project development. So, <clears throat> what we had talked about uh, at the last meeting was uh, compiling, compiling a list of barriers to methane mitigation. So I know that there was some information collected already um, by the, the Columbia member, and there was also an effort, I think, to collect some information from the Clean Air Task Force and try to organize that into something that could be um, played back to the subcommittee generally, but also with the idea of getting a, a smaller group of people who could, uh, could engage more directly, uh, probably through a conference call, on the development of that list of barriers and then uh, present that back to the group. So we didn't make the progress that we had hoped to uh, between the meetings, but I anticipate that we would continue that after this meeting and we'll probably do that with a call out to the subcommittee electronically. Um, and then uh, once we've got that list, then focus on conducting discussions, uh, attaching solutions to those project barriers. Uh, I think the connections are really strong to the material that was presented today because one key part of that is identifying financing options and mechanisms because that's often identified as one of the barriers to undertaking projects that make sense but just don't fit in with the business business line uh, in, in several instances. We should move on to the upcoming event. We are going to have in March the UN UNEP Six session of group of the experts on gas that would happen in March 25 to 26. That would be in Geneva, and we are going to have the 26th the meeting of the UNEC and the Oil and Gas Subcommittee of the Global Methane Initiative. We will have that meeting, and then the 27th we are going to have a workshop on methane emissions. So we really look forward to see you all in Geneva. And we are. We said uh, during our last call that we were going to have a, phone, uh, a conference call every three months. So we will uh, start uh, planning our next call. That it mo most probably will be January, end of January. Uh, and we would like to hear from you. What you, would you be expecting of this conference call? You could do it either through the chat, because we saw that there wasn't so good connection with the with the open microphones. Hi, Paulina. We do have a, a question that has come in. Um, what is the location of the March 27th workshop? Um, It's in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. That's right. Yeah, I think it's going to be co-located with the uh, um, with the meeting of the group of experts in the GMI. Right. So we, as a as a group, uh, together with the the UNECE, talked about that in Toronto and the idea of co-locating that meeting going forward, so that we would uh, be able to kind of cross fertilize ideas between the two groups. We have one more question. Does GMI provide funding or grants? Um, this is Kate. Um, in general, um, we don't provide that funding. In specific cases, we may be able to offer that opportunity. So I would suggest that you um, follow up with um, the GMI administrative support group on the, the contact information that was included in the slides. So we can also get your comments by uh, email 
So we would like to hear your comments on any of the issues that were raised during this uh, call. And we have a recording of this webinar and the presentation will be posted on the GMI website. And I don't know if you would like to add something, James, or anyone on the call. Sure, just briefly, this is James Diamond speaking again. And I, I, I think uh, what I'd like to do is kind of draw attention to the opportunities presented today. Thanks to uh, Monica, Dave, and, and, and Kate at the EPA for kind of helping bring this together. and and what we're trying to do with this subcommittee and, and the activity presented to it right now is draw the connections between the opportunities that are out there. And I think both the, the guidance document and the, the, the tool that, that will provide for companies, uh, for for countries looking at projects in, in, in their industry, and the methane challenge itself, um, you know, every one of these projects is a chance to profile uh, your success and to share that that our learning with with the group. So let's take advantage of this global methane challenge and let's uh, raise raise the profile of the individual activities that are uh, possible through the tools that are being presented right now. Okay. If, any other comments? Uh, we've had one question that came in. Um, would it be possible to start? Uh, showcasing projects at the workshop so that we can show what's possible. So I believe the question is with regard to the workshop um, coming up in March in Geneva, and the answer to that is certainly yes. Um, I think with regard to the Global Methane Challenge and the, the website that Monica highlighted earlier, um, while the challenge is a 2019 effort, um, there are opportunities for early actors to go on there today and submit their actions. And the, um, the GMI Administrative Support Group will follow up with you and make sure that those actions are being showcased in the way you want them to be on the website. So I think the intention of the challenge is to highlight um, these actions to reduce methane throughout 2019. And I would imagine that workshop would present a really excellent opportunity for that. So if we don't have any other comment, uh... Thank you all for participating and for all the presenters. And we'll be open in the by email to, to receive any more comments. Thanks, everyone. This concludes our broadcast.